I have my PhD in history, but I'm an expert in whooping it up. Woohoo! White gloves and dirty documents. That's how this historian gets down. I am JMZ. I'm a doctor, and my prescription is more shade. Hello, welcome back to Historians on Housewives. You're here with me, Casey. Dr. Jane Mill, the millionaires. Max Beer. In this episode, we discuss various topics in early American history with our guest, Crystal and Shoveland. In the first half of the episode, we discuss historical memory, food and family histories, settler colonialism, William Byrd and Native American slavery, sources and archives, and iconography of Pocahontas. We apply these conversations to analyzing the caste dynamics and family histories on Southern charm, especially as it relates to the BLM movement from the summer of 2020. As a note to our regular listeners, Max is mostly missing from this episode, dipping in and out sporadically around child care duties. But not to worry, he will be with us in his usual capacities in future episodes. So with that, Crystalyn Shoveland is an associate professor of history at the University of Southern Indiana, where she teaches courses on settler and indigenous America, the American South, and topics in colonial North America and the Atlantic world. Welcome to the show, Crystal and Shovelin. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Happy to be here. Would you like to share your Real Housewives tagline with us? Or I should say your Bravo Demic tagline with us. Yes, well, I'm that misbehaving, nasty wench writing and creating history, making the good wives and patriarchs anxious. I love it. That's cute. <laughs> I love it. That is a mega history nerd. Love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I read that and I was like, oh my goodness, that's such a great application of of text, like classic text that we read in our training. And so since you brought it up in your tagline, I thought we would go around and share our first introductions to Kathleen Brown's work and how it's influenced us. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I realized now that I was exposed to it as an undergrad uh, when I was in a seminar with Leah Gidlow on women's history at Bowling Green, but I didn't read it until I was in graduate school at Ole Miss, and I was in a seminar with Sheila Kemp, and she had us reading it alongside Kenneth Lockridge's On the Sources of Patriarchal Rage, and so it was endlessly fascinating to me because it was an entirely new lens into how we can examine the colonial past and the idea of gender in a way that I hadn't been taught before. Picture it, fall 1998, first seminar for graduate school in history at UCLA, Ruth Block's class, 246A, Colonial America. Um, the book was about two years old by then. We read it in seminar. I continue to remember that this um, guy in seminar, I even know his name, I won't say his name, but he kept saying, get Terrible. And my friends, the two of three of us were black, no, four of us were black. We kept looking at him like, you know, that's offensive, right? So I always remember like the fact that she found this great new way to talk about enslaved women, white women, and then white men all at the same time through the lens of this um, white colleague who was kept reducing the black women to tithables, tithables, or tithables, if you will, which that. She just used that source as a way to expand how we talk about black people or find black people in early America. Um, The book itself, I started as an early Americanist. I've recently jumped to the late 19th century, but I fully intend to come back. The the book was masterful. masterful. Um, I I mean, I could tangle a lot about it much, much more, but I won't because we have a whole hour and a half show to get to. Yes, buy new copies because I keep breaking the spine. <laughs> oh, wow. Now that's love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have a few copies floating around at our house uh, because Max and I went through our master's and now our PhD together. And so it was always two copies of all the books uh, because, you know, the notes shall not mix. <laughs> <laughs> and right. nor the notation styles. We need our own yeah, notes. We have our own styles. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, there is nothing that can just make either of our eyes twitch more than picking up the copy and realizing you don't have your copy, you have the other person's. Uh, So my first introduction to this piece, this book by Kathleen Brown, was um, my first um, graduate seminar in early America at San Francisco State during my master's. It was the fall of 2012, and um, Sarah Crabtree paired it so it was it was like a we read two two books I think maybe in the same week and so we did Edmund Morgan and Kathleen Brown together as is like a comparative approaches Mm -hmm. and uh you know I I felt like I don't think I'd ever talk so much about Bacon's Rebellion as I did that week (laughs) uh but Kathleen Brown's and I remember feeling so uh, like I wasn't ready for it at the time. My first, it was like one of the very first books I read as a graduate student. And I just remember thinking that like, I knew at the time it was one of those books that each time you go back, you get so much more than the last time for each, even now I go back to it and I think, Oh, I, I didn't get that before. You know, so it, it, each time I pick it up, I, I feel like I expand in in different ways in the way I'm thinking about race and, and gender and class and these dynamics in early America. I think I mean it's just a great book. I don't I don't think you can go back to it enough. Um, again, I will I I will see my fangirlness about this, um, <laughs> and we will go on to the next question, which is kind of related. <laughs> so. Tell us a little bit about your academic journey, and then I have some follow-up questions. Tell us how you ended up on the road here to this. Everything hinged upon this moment being interviewed on our podcast or in your present professional position. I'm one of those strange people that I think I knew from a very early age exactly what I wanted to be. I I always knew I wanted to be a writer, and I was endlessly fascinated by, by history. And I didn't realize that the rest of the world wasn't. <laughs> and that was a why, Can you imagine? I mean, what's wrong with these people? Why are you not fascinated by this? Um, so I ended up knowing about it as a discipline. I had a, a remarkable high school history teacher that allowed me to create an independent study when I was a junior. And so I was reading... Uh, you know, things from the Black Panthers as a junior, not fully understanding it, obviously, but ha- having this teacher who was, who was allowing me, who obviously was very inspired by Howard Finn, but was allowing me to explore beyond, and this was before standardized testing had really taken over, but to explore myself as a writer and to explore these topics. And then I went to Bowling Green in Ohio, and it was a really but a magical time, there were so many new assistant professors and established scholars in the history department there that it was just, you know, sort of percolating with energy. And so the seminars that I was able to take there and to be able to witness their diplomatic history graduate students work that they were doing really inspired me to pursue graduate study. So I went to DePaul for my master's. And then I went down to Ole Miss because I wanted to work originally with Sheila Skemp. And then I also started working with Robbie Eckridge over in the anthropology department as well. And it's been a wild ride ever since, but I'm still really passionate about it. And I just feel endlessly lucky I get to write. I get to see what I wanted to be when I was a geeky little kid asking the National Park Ranger about more details. I want to know more. Listen, I think that's great. I, too, wanted to be a writer. And I was an English major. And I decided I better take some history classes so I can know how to best write my historical novels. (laughs) So we are kindred spirits. We are kindred spirits. Um, So, okay. We also know that you are 
distantly related to William Byrd. How did you find this out? Were you doing historical work? Were you doing genealogy, like at family history libraries? How did you find this out? And how were you related? So I had two really that killed my best friends on the planet um, who also went on to do graduate work. And they were doing all Northern topics. And I, being the younger sister of the trio, wanted to do something completely different. I, I do not want to study anything that I'm related to, anything I'm connected to. I'm going to go to the South and I will not do anything to do with the Great Lakes. And ironically enough, I ended up going to the South to study Native people who migrated from the Great Lakes. Uh, but I, after I was done, my mom asked me to help her with genealogical work. And I knew on my biological father's side, recent Scandinavian emigres, but on my mother's side, it was lots of stories. And, you know, my aunt lovingly said, we're Heinz 57, English something, something, something. And so I just, I took a deep dive to help my mom out because she was really curious about the stories that she had heard growing up of being descended from the Gilberts and whether there was any connection to the, the very nefarious Humphrey Gilbert. There is mm-hmm. a connection mm-hmm. <laughs> to the very nefarious Humphrey Gilbert. Um, and then ironically enough, I found that I was connected to the Grendon family. And so related to birds through marriage. Uh, but also then related to a woman that I wrote extensively about in my dissertation and in my book, the oft-married Nasty Wench, uh, Sarah Mm. Harris, Stegg, Grendon, last husband was Brain. So I I laugh Mm. at myself constantly because I went all the way out of my way to not study people I knew, then ended up studying people that I was related to and that were directly connected to where I grew up. So... That's how the world well, works. <laughs> it's how the world works. I just did a few workshops on family history, so I'm in that zone right now. But you can't run away from people who are trying to choose you to write their story. So you did try to run away, and they said, knock, knock. No, no. You're nope. going to steward our story. So <laughs> that's the perfect history story. That's how it's supposed to happen, right? Um, okay, well, let's switch to talking about this first book that you did. Um, Casey, do you have any questions regarding the first book, or can I jump in and be a nerd? Uh, you can go for it, Jessica, since you're already okay, there. Great. Wonderful. Okay, great. So, your first book, Anglo-Native Virginia, Trade, Conversion, and Indian Slavery in the Old Dominion. Tell us oh, 1646 to 1722 for you early American if out there. Uh, tell us about your process. I mean, you t- just told us a little bit about it. But tell us about your process of researching and writing your book. And I, and I say this because we do have history grad students that listen to this and people who do family history. Some people all don't really understand really what it means to go into a physical archive and oh, what okay. what that entails. I didn't realize that either. Like, what? You haven't been going to archives since you were a kid? You're just curious. Um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about your archival work in addition to kind of your process for writing the book. Well, first tip, make friends with the archivist and the folks who are going Always. to uh, to their, They know their facts way more than <laughs> finding aids. And, you know, for you know younger generations, like being able to just search for things and thinking that they don't have to talk to people and I'm not being facetious because talking to people is sometimes very difficult for me too. But, that creating that relationship is one of the most important components of, of research. And I came to the project because of, you know, going back to our earlier discussion, because of seminar. I'm taking a history mm-hmm. seminar and we're reading Edmund Morgan. And mm-hmm. then I'm taking an anthropology seminar and we're reading Eric Bounds, West O Indian. And the, the story of Bacon's Rebellion it isn't, isn't adding up. And, you know, I have these serious questions about the role of indigenous slavery. And then, of course, reading Alan Galley's work uh, a little bit, you know, later that semester. And I realized that I, I wanted to know more about what was happening with what my advisor, Robbie Eswich, calls the shatter zone. And 
going into Virginia and taking a look at the role it played in creating the situation that led to the slave trade, the indigenous slave trade in South Carolina, but then also thinking about everything that I've learned about bird up into this mm-hmm. point. And having mm-hmm. read Lockridge, having read Brown, you know, having to go through and discussing his infamous flourish to to, to reconsider that everything that we think we know about Bird is part of the story. It's not that it's not true, but there's more to it. And to reconsider this role of the native slave trade and the power that it played for these founding families. And in the case of Virginia, there are entire counties where you're not going to find any examples of native slavery. However, in the very powerful counties like Charles City and Henrico, it's going to be an epidemic. And so it's something that, you know, we can use those phrases like hidden in plain view. When I went into the archive, I was expecting I'm going to have to put on my ask the history hat and I'm going to have to look for hidden examples or where it's not clear. And in Instead, what I found was that it was mm-hmm. alarming with fear frequently. We chose not to see it. Right. And it brings me right. to my issues that I have. I think the Colonial Records Project needs to be redone in part mm-hmm. because so many people are reliant upon it because they can't get yeah. the archives. It's expensive to go to the archives. Paleography is hard. You know, sitting over, Mm -hmm. microfilm has gotten so much better, but sitting over these machines and trying to decipher antiquated 17th century English where they're semi-literate and there's sometimes smatterings of French or Latin, it's a process that's very, very difficult. I'm sorry, Crystal, and I need to break in, and, and I swear as I say this, this is the truth. Some people actually don't know what a microfilm machine is. Oh, <laughs> yes. I'm so, <laughs> I mean, I am too. I prefer it on a microfilm reader, but can you just for our audience explain what it is? <laughs> yes. You know, so the Colonial Records Project did this extensive work in the 20th century where they went and they went ahead and they scanned a number of these documents that were useful to a lot of genealogy, to be honest. Um, to these first families of Virginia, and this is really po- popular in New England as well. And so you could go to the, these machines and see this, you know, this this film. They're now there's the ability to zoom in on them, to easily save them, to to print them. Um, but sometimes, depending on you know the resources of your library, they don't have the really fancy machines. So it could be a really laborious process. Thus, uh, these genealogical companies, you know, often Mormon companies coming out of Utah, mm-hmm. went in and they abstracted all of these documents. But the abstracts are in and of themselves a different document. And so right. one of my favorite of the Colonial Records abstracts is a gentleman by the name of Beverly Fleet. And I say favorite because he liked to make comments and he was he like, it. I don't want to write about this next record. It's boring to me. <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding? And, but then you go in, you find, Oh, there's all this ethnographic detail about the Indian trade here. Not important to him, not mm-hmm. related to the, whatever project he was doing in his head, but at least he was honest. The, some of the other abstracts, he you just have to hope that it's as intact as it can be. So going back to the original record is so, so important, but it's, it's a project that's going to require, you know, very numerous grants and and graduate students and and, and workers, but it's, it's a problem. This is such a, I I think, important point. Sorry, Casey. Um, Go ahead, Casey. Sorry, Jessica. Um, You know, students, students are constantly, coming in to um, like the start of a course, you know, thinking that sources aren't biased, that like it's historical fact, right? Like just show me the facts. And, you know, it's, this is such a great example of the sources that exist 
uh, are super problematic. You know, like the abstract themselves creates an entirely new source. And if you go by the abstract without looking at the original, that's really different sets of information. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's, it's hard because, you know, I work you know, mainly with undergraduates, of course, but it's really hard to, to get past that idea of that we could always get to this fact and that these edited collections don't have a bias in and of themselves. Yeah, or like when I, when I give them excerpts from, you know, a, a edit, like a little primary source edited volume and they want to gravitate toward that opening blurb, right? But then explaining that like, what if you didn't look at the blurb? What if you just dove into the source, you know? And so, so I, sometimes I'll even like kind of mark those blurbs out if I feel like it's not helping at all, you know, because some of those blurbs can be better than others too to situate oh, students absolutely. within the source. But in, in that way, I, f- I feel like those blurbs sometimes are, can be detrimental. Like this person who is like, I'm not interested in talking about this next source. It bores me. You know what I mean? It, it can kind of have that effect too. Absolutely. And don't, and don't sorry, go ahead. Kristen. Sorry. No, I was just agreeing. That's absolutely. I mean, don't you think this is a perfect example if we have any undergrads that are listening? This is what happens also when undergrads try to cheat on papers. And so they go off to Google and they take that first snippet that comes up in the search and they say Frederick Douglass is X. And so then we have 20 students saying the exact same sentence because they actually don't go into the link. Like that, that's the same kind of concept. Like Google is giving us a snapshot of what the docu- document is about, just like these abstracts did. And if you don't go and do the investigation, you could actually get a completely skewed view of what was going on. Um, this is my little nerdy moment. I'm really turned on today by all the nerdiness and the early American <laughs> history and all the documents. So, I think you miss early um, American history a little bit, Jessica. I miss it so much, but, but, and I miss it so much. And I am going back there after I do this next book. Um, but I also feel like there's also stories that I'm being called to write. But, oh, yes, I'm definitely going back there after this next book. <laughs> so, Crystalyn, you work yes. on the settler memory of the colonial indigenous past as it relates to Florida and the Native South. Can you explain what settler memory is, what we're talking about when we talk about this colonial and indigenous past, and you know, what is happening in Florida and, you know, what is this difference between designating Florida versus the Native South? So just unpacking all of this for us. Absolutely. So I am deeply wedded to colonial history, but as even as I was researching the first book and as I was teaching, I became really fascinated and interested in how people remember the past. And the the issues of what Boyd Cochran calls settler innocence, and these these works as they relate to creating American identity, and as it relates to my work, I was I've always been fascinated by the legends that people tell about Pocahontas and the interest that people have in what I write about and of course the disappointment when they realize that I'm not writing about the the little snippet that they they think is is most fascinating. And so the Florida project relates to the town of Vero Beach and in the center of town there's a nineteenth late nineteenth century, early twentieth century building that's mission style deliberately mission style with a giant Pocahontas relief on the top of it. And it was the setting of the Indian River Farms Company. And it was a group of investors from Iowa who moved south to pursue citrus dreams. And they created a wealth of booster literature. And it was all about Native people not indigenous Florida. So it had the Sleepy Eye Lodge, so a Dakota that was known to be quote unquote friendly to the white man. 
and the Pocahontas building. And they completely ignored and obfuscated the history of the ice and the Seminole. And eventually there's an Osceola Boulevard. But they, they wanted to tell these stories that people were familiar with from the North that were moving South. They were deliberately avoiding any stories of the actual experiences of native peoples in Florida of the lived experiences of African Americans, of the legacy of the Confederacy. They only wanted to, to talk about, because it was an Indian River, these stories that they deemed quote unquote picturesque. And I was really interested in pursuing that a little bit more. Just because at the end of the day, what we do is remarkably important. But I also think that it's worthwhile for us to meet people where they are and to understand the stories that communities tell about themselves and the ways in which it intersects with myth-making and memorialization. And Eugenie you know, O'Brien's got this fascinating book on that Stoic statue uh, that she did with Lisa Blee and the many iterations of this statue around the, around the country. And so taking what we do as early Americanists and understanding it through a broader audience well through into the 20th century of this creation of identities and, and stories and who gets left out of these, these stories in particular. Uh, you know, and as soon as like people start talking about historical memory of Pocahontas, I instantly go into, you know, the Disney Pocahontas and then Pocahontas 2, Journey to a New World, where it was like, I remember as a child, I was just a child and I was incredibly upset. I was like, what do you mean she didn't end up with John Smith, right? It was like this complete, like it was like this, first, it was really the first time I was like, I'm being lied to all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I rem I can remember being incredibly indignant as a child that I was like, if it's supposed to like, why, why would you just remake this history in like such a clearly false way? Like you're feeding me lies, you know? And, um, so this is just fascinating to me that there is this Pocahontas statue that is creating a very specific memory of a place that's not even in Virginia. Right. That's what, that's why my mouth is just open. I don't know why I'm surprised. Excuse me. I don't know why I'm surprised, but I'm surprised. Well, there was a Pocahontas gold mine in California at one point too. Um, in Oregon. Right. And oh, no, Oregon. Okay. Same as trend. Um, it was very much a Gilded Age progressive era trend to name places after Pocahontas. There was a Pocahontas mine, um, well, the Pocahontas coal field, just uh, to the east of me towards uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Western Virginia, um, Tazewell County is where it's located, but it's one of the richest coal seams in the world. And then there was another town in Canada, a uh, short-lived coal mining settlement that was named for Pocahontas as well. And so these, these settlements are, are playing upon this idea of Pocahontas as a, the so-called good Indian. And many of the settlers that moved into Florida also were members of this bizarre fraternal organization called the Order of the Redmen or the improved order of the Redmen, excuse me. And then their daughters and wives were in the auxiliary, the Pocahontas um, auxiliary. And so I have actual images of young girls dressing up and playing Indian and playing Pocahontas. And the, the poems that they write about her are all about her yielding to the English, yielding to Christianity, and then when you read the booster literature, it's all about the soil yielding as well. And so it becomes what Raina Green calls the Pocahontas perplex. This 
she's no longer a historical person. And so many scholars of the contact area are spending, uh, are doing incredible work at, about who she was and what her story is. But at the same time, I think it's really important for us to consider there are so many people out there who still fall trope to the Disneyfication, but the Disneyfication comes from much older traditions of the 19th century as well of, of creating her as a caricature of saving the Virginia colony and not telling the truly horrific tale of what she actually experienced. So is it, would it be fair to say that this trend of Pocahontas naming um, also serves as a way to dispossess, right? Like she gets framed as the quote unquote, like good Indian because of um, you, you had this discussion of like, like things that are being yielded, yielded away. Uh, so is this also like part of like a uh, friendly dispossession or that kind of like settler mindset? Yeah, in a way, you know, it's this idea of by taking these names and taking and claiming Pocahontas as their own, as, as the settlers own, they are legitimizing their own claim to, to these territories. And it's in, in some way, they are trying to make themselves the natives of the land. Uh, and Phil Deloria explores this if you want to know more, because he's got some really great essays uh, that deal with these, these tropes that emerge. Okay. Shifting gears a little bit. Amazon, because I, I, like, I did the deep dive, Crystalline. Amazon tell, told me that you had a book come out just a few months ago called Classic Restaurants of Evansville. And I was like, oh my goodness, food and a book. And like, let's just talk about Evansville and these restaurants and how that came to be. And did you get to eat anything delicious <laughs> in this process? Yes. Well, I- I'm sure you found like when you're reading the, you know, primary sources or I'm reading like trade journals, uh, I was, always finding little mentions of food ways. And so I would love to include them in my classes just as little side notes. Like this is, William Bird loved to talk about what he was eating. So <laughs> yeah, like this is what William Bird had today. Um, or, and so I, I like to include food ways because it gets students interested. Uh, they're horrified when I teach the American South class when we talk about uh, the recipe books about how to return meat that has spoiled. Um, the various, you know, supplements for coffee when coffee is not available. And so those sort of things I like to include in my class discussions because it, it always gets them thinking and, and talking. And I like to also ask them about their food ways. You know, what are things that you grew up eating that are family traditions and and what have you. And we talk about how it has changed over time, um, thinking about how, you know, those have Okinawa and our Japanese descent have spam traditions that come from GIs being a part of uh, of their of their lives in the American occupation and how now there are traditional recipes involving spam, those sort of things. And so I've always been interested in 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 food ways and stories. And I found here here in Evansville that people would respond in one of two ways, and it's not just an Evansville thing, but in general, people respond in one of two ways when you tell them that you're a historian. The number one is, I hated history. It's stupid, boring. It was my least favorite class. Why do you like history? And I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, and then the number two was, I love history. Here's my family story. And let me tell you something about this. Oh, you're new to Evansville. Let me tell you all these, you know, little inside secrets. And this happened frequently enough that I thought, you know, somebody should write these down. These are fascinating histories. And then finally I realized, dummy, 
you. <laughs> you are the somebody. You should write these out. So I started a collaborative project um, with a colleague of mine over in the communications program and with our students because we have this giant festival traditionally. We didn't have it um, really this past year because of, of course, um, COVID, but it's a charitable event called the Fall Festival. It lasts the entire week long. It is anything that can be fried is fried. Uh, fried butter, for example, which is really just a biscuit with a giant slab of butter in the middle of it. But it sounds cool. Oh, wow. Fried butter. Uh, and all, But all of these charitable organizations have their own food that they sell every single year that you that people just can't wait to get their hands on you know this church's chicken and dumplings or you know uh, a pickleback you know a briny pickle pickleback shot that sort of stuff and we started the oral history project there just walking around talking to people uh trying to tease out family recipes where we could this is going back generations um, for this West Side Nut Club Fall Festival. And after that, I had collected enough little stories that I started to put together the restaurant history book. And there's a lot of interesting traditions here in Evansville. Um, one of the most famous of which is the Brain Sandwich um, up at the Hilltop Inn. I have not eaten a brain sandwich yet. I am mm, not certain mm. that I will. <laughs> uh, there's an Alton Brown episode where he went and ate the brain sandwich. If you're interested, uh, it's, it's out there. Uh, but it's this old, old stagecoach um, space that has been there since the 19th century and has, you know, wonderful stews. And it's connected now to a, a local barbecue joint. And we have pizza that's really similar to St. Louis style pizza. It's the Una style pizza, cracker crust, very gooey cheese, cut into squares. And every place is just a little bit different in terms of what their specialty is. A lot of beer. Um, the, they have fish bowls of beer, uh, ice cold, and competitions over who has the coldest beer. But what the story that I found the most fascinating when I was working on the book is all about this place called F Restaurant, which was, you know, 1950s, fancy downtown establishment with, you know, huge hang off the plate steaks. But the owners liked Cantonese. Mm -hmm. And they brought in Cantonese cooks to Evansville to help them master the dishes. And so the first one was a man, uh, Lee Wa Chung, and then he recruited other family members. And those families have now, for basically a 150-mile region, if there's Cantonese food in town, it's all connected back to S Restaurant in Evansville and to those original recipes, which I thought was, was pretty cool wow. and pretty interesting because I'm in you know, southwestern Indiana, and you don't think of southwestern Indiana, uh, you know, outside of maybe its German heritage. Um, and so thinking about these ethnic foodways is, was a really interesting avenue for me to pursue. So we are going to lighten it up. We've been in early America for a long time. Thank you to our gentle listeners. <laughs> <laughs> We've been in America, early America for a long time. Um, let's switch to reality TV, Crystalyn. So what were some of your gateway shows? How did you get into watching reality TV? Well, I have to geek out that the there's going to be a, like a reboot, not really a reboot, like a, a visitation to the original Real World New York, because that was it. I, I, I like, heard that. <laughs> I heard that. Okay. And that was endlessly interesting to me. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, as a teenager, in middle school and teenage years, that's what I was doing as I was watching MTV and in real world. And so that's what got it started. But then I became a very serious scholar <laughs> in graduate school, and I refused to watch. I missed out on all of the Paris Hilton stuff. I missed out 
on all of um, the Kardashians, no, you know, none, none of that. But when I got my, when I got tenure, I thought, I have enough friends that love Bravo, you know, obsessed with Bravo and have all sorts of opinions that so I'm going to, I'm going to start watching some, some Bravo. But like a typical historian, I went to Southern Charm first because I'm like, well, I know, I know the name Ravenel. I know more. I want to know more about this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I started with Southern Charm and then it has quickly um, ballooned from there, mm-hmm. uh, especially mm-hmm. with the pandemic, uh, 100% uh, in the deep catalog of, of Bravo at this point. But I do, I do re- still Southern Charm and the Lodak are probably my favorite. Okay, which below deck? Because I didn't think I'd be a below deck fan, and I started with Mediterranean, and now I've been watching the the, the original. Which below deck do you like? I'm a below deck classic. I okay. love. Uh, I love Kate Chastain. So this last season was a little a little rocky. Uh, well, okay, it was rocky. You probably needed rocky, and then it would have been probably better. <laughs> um, but no, I. Below Deck Med, just while I enjoyed Hannah, it 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 never really gelled for me as much. I watch it, but it's sort of more of a side eye watching than pure just enjoyment. Hannah, Hannah June, <laughs> Hannah, June. Hannah, or is it June June <laughs> Hannah? See, I don't even know. We just put that tagline on one of our T-shirts. By the way, we have H on H swag. Check out our website. Uh, Casey just made some H and H swag that used. I guess it was June June Hannah. I was saying Hannah Hannah June. Um, so I want to go back to this, just to, to Thomas Ravenel and also to Kate Chastain just a minute, because the newest gossip, but by the time this airs, this will be old gossip. The newest gossip that came across our, our, um, radar and our text messages is that Catherine is now dating this descendant of uh, an, an African American man whose family was enslaved by Thomas Ravenel's family. And everyone's shocked. But he has the same last name. So I'm just wondering, are you up to date on Southern Charm? I am up to date on Southern Charm. I was, my rant, uh, when I saw people saying, oh, they're not related. I'm like, do you not know how enslavement works? Right. Like, how, how is that not something that you're aware of? But then I'd also watch the last season of uh, Southern Charm where they're like, what? What did Calhoun do? I never knew any of this. <laughs> Someone should write a book about this. And I'm like slamming. Wow. Into the table. Like, they wow. have books about these things. This is also where I need Casey to weigh in on the Kate Chastain. Because we have the Kate Chastain update. She just walked away from what show, Casey? Um, you can she, tell that Casey is like the historian for us. <laughs> she uh, walked away from Bravo's chat room, which she was one of the executive producers of so it was like kind of like a a round table with her and Portia Hannah from Summer House and uh, Giselle Bryant from Potomac and um, they would kind of chat about the goings on in the most recent episodes airing on Bravo and she very suddenly uh, decided that it was time for her to leave her own show now, did wow. she, or did Portia get her fired? Because oh. Twitter is saying that Portia may have pushed her out. Oh, what was the uh, well, animosity? I don't, we, I don't know. I have I have no idea. But I like there, Kate hasn't said a single thing about it, and so there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not there was something wrong with her and Portia. Who is your favorite Bravo celebrity, and what gets them this special status from you? I'm so material. It really depends on what I'm watching. Um, at the time, uh, I used to really, really love Erica Jane. Uh, just the character of Erica Jane and how she is so, so seamlessly crafted uh, a persona for her herself and in, in Beverly Hills and, and that that whole thing. Uh, I have really enjoyed Dorinda's antics offline. Did not enjoy them on screen. 
uh, this last season of, of Roni. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's usually Erica Jane, but not, not so much more recently. Okay. Well, you know, I actually learned from a piece you wrote of fact that Erica Jane um, was crafted after Erica Kane. How did I not know this? I feel like you wrote this piece and I said, oh, how did I not know this? So it makes complete sense now. But lately you don't like her. Is that because of the lawsuit or just because of just her overall antics on the show or lack thereof? Lack thereof. Uh, you know, the off screen stuff definitely colors the story as well that some of their wealth, Ill, I mean, ill begotten gained for sure. And that's just, yeah, that like you were you were mentioning, um, Casey, that you, you could have a a level of suspension of disbelief, and then it's like, oh wait, what am I forming? <laughs> what what am I what am I fanning over? And how are how are they acting? I don't know if I can go that far. Oh, totally. I feel like that's kind of where I even am with Ronj right now, or it's like none of these people I I should. No, I should be on no one's side, like, <laughs> but the, like, it's like such a sport where it's kind of oh. like, you still are going to pick a side anyway. Oh. And it's just, it's so difficult not to. And it's really hard sometimes to keep suspending, uh, everything to just keep going as a regular viewer. I feel like the most recent episode of Ron, they had to throw in the house husbands just because they knew that we couldn't handle it. They needed the the levity of the house husbands enough to make the, the episode watchable because that was pretty rough. With that, it's time for our Bonko Party game break. I'm so excited. You know I don't do well in the game, but I'm so excited. <laughs> well, and today's game will be particularly... I think interesting uh, because it's going to be a competition, full competition. Okay. So there are no there like are no these. mutual panels here. And today, I, like I know, I know, but it's not Bravo trivia, so uh, we could all surprise each other. Uh, today's game, I'm calling Charmed. I'm sure, uh, and it's essentially I'm asking questions about. Um, you know, the Southern etiquette of a dinner party. Um, I think, I think it's just going to be you and Crystal and today. I think Max is going to have to take the baby out. So I, I'm going to ask questions uh, to see who can qualify as a guest at one of uh, Miss Pat's uh, Southern balls slash dinners. Question one, if someone is toasting you, A, you take the first sip, B, you do not take a sip at all, or C, you sip after the toaster? Um, I don't know that answer. Should what you both lock in? Should we both, should you both lock in your responses so we can't cheat? I think it's B. No. You think it's C? B. B? Yeah. Um, I would say B. I, and, and not just because Crystal said it. I would say B. You're going with B too, Crystal? You're sticking yeah, I with went with B. Perfect. Uh, B is the correct answer. You do not take a sip when someone is toasting you. Because you're being toasted. Yeah. yeah okay, so everyone go. else has this. <laughs> okay. 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 We're, we're, we're doing fine. Next. <laughs> Question two, gentlemen at the table must A, help make the plate of the woman to their right. B, always help the woman to their right, regardless if they are dating or not when she sits and rises from her chair. C, captivate the woman to their right with appropriate dinner conversation. I'm going to say B. Yeah, I'm going to say B as well. The correct answer was B. They must always help the woman to their right, regardless if they are dating or not, when she sits and rises from her chair. Question three. Wonderful. When passing items at the table, A, 
never intercept something on its way to someone else. B, it's okay to take a roll when the basket is being passed to someone else and you're along the way. C, items can never be passed counterclockwise. I think it's C. <laughs> I think that's probably C as well, but that's a lot. Are you guys going with C as in cat? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The answer is A, never intercept something on its way to someone else. You need to ask, oh, yeah. you Sorry, need to ask for it to sense. come back to you afterward, but you can't that take something on its way to someone else. Yeah. That would make sense. Next question. When it comes to adding salt and pepper, A, more is always better. B, never add more than three shakes of each. C, it's rude to season before tasting. Well, C is definitely true, but I don't know if it's the etiquette rule. But I'm going to go with C. I'm going to go with C, but I actually thought, according to Miss Manners, yes, I have the book, that you never season the food because it's an insult to the chef. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. Yes, it is C, and that's why. They consider it incredibly rude if you add salt and pepper before you taste the dish. Because then you're assuming you, that, the, that the chef did not season appropriately. Yes. Thank you. And let me get the title correct. Miss Manners' Guide to Excruciatingly Polite uh, Behavior. Oh, if wow. anyone is, if every, anyone wants to know how to properly do things. I mean, it's not necessarily something I adhere to, but it's quite interesting. Oh, that would be a fantastic thing to do one day. Sit down with Miss Manners and Countess Luann's book and see how much overlaps. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be great. Next question. Once you've picked up your utensil for your meal, A, you must be sure to receive new utensils between each course. B, you are allowed to rest them back down beside your dish. C, your utensils must never touch the table again. I'm sure I do this wrong. Okay, say it one more time. Once you've picked up your utensil from your meal, A, you must be sure to receive new utensils between each course. B, you are allowed to rest your utensils back down beside your dish. C, your utensils must never touch the table again. I feel like the utensils are swapped out between courses. It's either resting by the dish or swapped out. I don't know. I think it's A or C. You guys going to lock in final answers? A and I don't know. And D, I'm not going to that shit, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll say C and I also don't know. It is C. Apparently, it's incredibly rude because if you put the utensil back down on the linen, it can stain the linen. So oh, that makes sense as well. So you're, you're once you pick but it I didn't up, I knew utensils with every single thing. I know you're supposed to rest it on the plate, not on the linen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're allowed to put it back down on the plate, but you you are not supposed to put the utensils back down onto the table after you pick them up. Okay. Last question okay. in our in our in our competition today. When eating soup, it's appropriate to a scoop your soup with the spoon tilted away from you, b blow on it to cool it down, c sip directly from the bowl. A. A. It's a yes. You must tilt your spoon away from you as you uh, eat your soup. So, which is not how I eat my soup to like get every piece of like the broth possible, like no, <laughs> yeah. all. And I'm left-handed, so I'm trying to think how does that work. Like I don't understand how you 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 put you move the spoon away from you. Tell me what the, what what is, how does that work? I don't know. I don't tilt my spoon away. You're very delicate. I'm, I'm like not like you can see me. <laughs> like I'm doing it with my hands. You're very delicately getting the a bit of the soup, so you're not, you know, scooping it into your mouth. You're oh, so the soup acts as like a dam against the rest of the soup, and you just like a tiny little okay, definitely okay. 
So how did we do, Casey? Did you even keep score? Uh, it was a pretty tight score. Uh, uh, Crystal and wins our game of Charmed, I'm sure, by one point. So it was it was it was it was a real okay. nail biter. <laughs> it was to so the party we will never I'm, be invited to, and even if we were, we wouldn't go. We're not going. We're not going. I'm sure you're a nice lady, Miss Patricia, but the fat dinner party, South Carolina, uh, uh, ancestrally, it just uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, but for the sake of the podcast, I participated. <laughs> um okay this is when we have leading music that says we're back so we're back to the interview uh <laughs> so crystalline here at eight on eight we balance scholarship with pop culture and we heard from jason herbert that you advocated for historians of the movie to view wait for it the dirt Tell us about your Motley Crue fandom. What led you to this film choice? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm on a daily sex scene with, with Jason, and I'm constantly telling him the films that I want to watch. Uh, and sometimes they make it into, into the, the lineup. But I am a child of MTV. And so I, I, I loved that whole era. And so the ability to to sit down with, with historians and historians to be talking about, about Motley Crue and that whole era of LA and debauchery. And it was, it was something that I thought would be a lot of fun. So you have no idea how sad I was when we pitched the dirt to Jason and he said, Oh, we've already done that. <laughs> what? I missed this moment. Like Motley Crue, Max and I bonded over the fact that we both know 80s rock music. <laughs> and so I was so sad. And I even con slash pressured, I, I can't even lie. I used my influence as a senior scholar to to browbeat him into letting us watch it again. And then Casey and Max were like, you know, that kind of wasn't cool. Can we watch something else? <laughs> <laughs> I never flaunt my, 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 my more senior status. But that one I felt so, so, it was so important to do. But then they said, yeah, you can't really do that. So then I felt bad. And we ended up watching, what, Murder Mystery? Murder Mystery, yeah. Which was great. Um, but yes, I respect you even more, Crystal, because I did not know you were the, the person behind um, asking them to watch The Dirt. And um, that's where I'll leave it. That's <laughs> where I'll leave it. I may or may not have tickets for the stadium tour on Labor Day, and Max may or may not be going with me because my father um, might not be able to make it. So, you know, oh. that's all. I'll leave it there. <laughs> a lot of fun. They put on, um, so many of these 80 stars put on really, really great shows. Really great shows. One of the best concerts I've ever been to was Billy Idol in the 2000s. Old oh, Billy Idol. love. <laughs> would love. Like Rebel Yell, Billy Idol, or before that? No, this was when, you know, this is in the, the early 2000s. This is when he was older, and he just put on this, fantastic you know retrospect of all of his work and his more recent stuff um but with energy to spare and i walked out of the concert hall that was probably one of the best concerts i've ever been to whoa whoa well so good stuff sting Sting did a very good concert i saw sting in um champaign illinois when i had a job there and it was i was like okay sting is ageless but i also saw tina turner when i first came to orange county about 10 years ago. So, and then, then I think she was in her late 60s, early 70s. Also phenomenal show. I mean, um, you know, they just must have ate better back, back then. <laughs> when we were younger. <laughs> yeah, but now Molly Crew, I don't know that they ate better. Uh, no, no, They're like no. eating top preserves, though. Like, they're, <laughs> they're good to go. <laughs> I have kind of a random question about the dirt and Motley Crue, I guess. So I just realized that Machine Gun Kelly and Tommy Lee are actually friends. And so, uh, yeah. and so like, it was like, I guess this like kind of fun, special, I guess, sweet for rockers uh, moment when Machine Gun Kelly was like, oh, I'm going to play you in the dirt. <laughs> but then I was like, wait, does, 
does, do any of us listen to Machine Gun Kelly? Because I don't. I didn't know who he was before the dirt. And I've not listened to any of his music since. And I actually don't recognize him out of his Tommy Lee makeup and everything because I've seen pictures of him. And I'm like, that's not, oh, I, I oh, he doesn't have black hair. <laughs> I, I didn't even know who he was. Did you know who he was before the movie, Crystalline? I do. Uh, I did. He has connections to Cleveland. Uh, so that, that's how I was aware of him. It's not really the music that I that I listen to at this, this stage of my life, but I'm familiar enough. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's all I have to say. I do. I will say he did an impeccable Tommy Lee. Oh, yeah. Really good. <laughs> really good. So, are we ready? You, are we ready to get back yeah. more into research in Southern Charm? Yes. Fabulous. So, Crystalyn, can you tell us more about how your new research project has a small connection to Shep Rose? Yes. Uh, so, my new project is all about this town, Vera Beach, and it's a place that I've known my entire life that I don't know. My uh, my dad, the man who raised me, his family had been going down there since the early 20th century from Cleveland. And so I had all these really amazing stories about old Florida and the way that it, that it used to be. And as I mentioned, I was really intrigued and curious about the Pocahontas building and the story behind that. But as I got more into the project, I became interested in, in understanding this idea of, of old Florida and, and, and what have you. And so the project has expanded to, to dealing with one of the original settlers, this man named Waldo Sexton, who was really inspired by the world's exposition that he saw in St. Louis. And he became sort of obsessed with it. And he went about collecting materials that he saw at the St. Louis Exposition, including this giant table uh, that was originally from the Philippines that he placed into what was then called the Jungle Garden that he made with this man named Arthur McKee. The Jungle Garden was intended to be a World's Fair small. And in it, they had all sorts of collections of orchids and they, they, of course, had live monkeys, as you do in roadside Americana um, in places like Florida. But they also worked closely with the Seminole tribe to create a settlement of Seminole living at, at the Jungle Garden. And so it's something that I'm still unpacking uh, at, at, this, at this stage in, in my research. But it's a bizarre story, uh, certainly, this idea of a living zoo and what was going on um, down in Bureau. And so I'm interested to hear uh, people's thoughts on it, but of course, trying to still unpack it myself. But Bureau was this very deliberate place that was meant to be a commercial endeavor. The Orchid Isle side of Bureau was a little bit more of a playground for the rich, but it was never intended to be anything like West Palm Beach or Miami or places south that were these, you know, really elaborate uh, places of obscene wealth, you know? And so it, it amused me when Shep, on one of the reunions last year, was talking about his grandmother and how his grandmother even was very judgmental of people. And she would always say that people were from zero beach because that meant that you were a nobody. Except it's not true. Um, it's called Zero Beach because nothing happens there. It's not because they're the wrong type of people. It's because it's a very sleepy place that was deliberately uh, intended to, to be this sort of refuge um, as opposed to a place of ostentation and, and wealth or the place to see and be seen like Palm Beach. Interesting. So there's, you know, so there's always this sort of enclave beyond the enclave. So there's the popular enclave that everyone needs to be seen at, and then there's that well, we are so elite that we actually don't want to be seen. In a way, absolutely. It's where um, 
now it's kind of funny because it's the place where celebrities from places uh, south uh, will buy homes because they don't want to be seen. And so you, uh, like Mark Anthony has a house there. Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> Lauren, okay. It has, you know, a, a resort there, but it's a place where they're not going to run into the paparazzi and they're, and nobody cares that, that they're there. And it's not, it's not a, it's not a big to do if you, if you see someone out and about. Interesting. Okay. I imagine it's kind of like some parts of LA where people are, are, Actually, despite paparazzi, people are actually more polite when people who live here <laughs> are more yeah. polite when they see celebrities and just let them go about their business. Um, exactly. Okay, interesting. Okay, so we are now on to a great question. A great question. Let me set it up for you because I love to use popular culture in my classes. I've now, they've now devolved into every class starts with a JMZ moment. <laughs> like talking about popular culture and TV and link it to whatever's going on in the class. I used to think professors who did that was, were so corny until I realized, wait, I'm actually, this makes it easy, very easy for me to get involved. So how do you utilize popular culture and TV when you teach Southern history? When I teach Southern history, you know, we will occasionally view clips from, from Southern Charm. We'll, we'll talk about the, the naming of bridges and, and what that will mean uh, for people and how they they view a space and what naming and claiming can do to erase the, the darker areas of history. We'll we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about how ostentatious and amazing Charleston is now, but how horrible Charleston was in the, the colonial period. Um, not only of course because of the the violence of the slave era, but because of yellow fever epidemics and smallpox epidemics. And so we will juxtapose the idea of Charleston with some of the more grimmer realities. So to take a look at the tourist side, and I view Southern Charm as very much a part of the tourist for sure of, of the places to go to see and be seen the plantations to visit you know what what restaurants you should go to um it's it's right out of you know a manual of how to visit how to visit places like charleston how does reality tv help students understand historical memory with things like the lost lost cause Does, does it resonate or how do you make it resonate it's it's often difficult to get students to really understand how pervasive the lost cause is because they have a tendency to have fallen trope to it as well. And so there's a lot of deconstruction that has to go on with understanding the the role of how we write about the past and how in in some ways in that hearts and minds campaign that we have to, to think about how much within popular culture we have all been witness to the lost cause winning Mm -hmm. and becoming not a Southern problem, but Mm -hmm. a national problem. And so it doesn't work quite well to just focus on, on shows like, like Southern charm, but to, to go back to looking at major national films like the Patriot and how Mm -hmm. they try to have this bizarre, storyline that they were not enslaved and that they were in fact, you know, fighting as, as freed men alongside the Benjamin Martin character. And so it's something that we, I have, uh, I haven't expected it yet by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a lot of magical thinking that takes place um, with students that they're, you know, they're sort of, that's a Southern issue. Mm-hmm. And that's only something that's happening in the South and a desire not to focus on the legacies of racial terror and the deeply rooted systemic racism that is present everywhere in, in the United States and is present everywhere because of, here's where I'm ranting, <laughs> is you know, present because of our abandonment of Reconstruction. Okay. 
Okay, interesting. I, I like the focus that, you know, I mean, the reality, right? That it's not a Southern, it's not just a Southern conversation. It is actually a national conversation. Um, okay. Um, Which is like so interesting see. in some ways. Sorry, just like running with this Southern charm was like a, as an entry point into this that like part of what makes Craig acceptable to them as this like quote unquote Yankee that's in Charleston mm-hmm. is that his, his politics are close enough to what they all have in their particular group in Charleston that like they can just make fun of him from being from the North, but you know, he still becomes somebody that's like acceptable to hang with in the early seasons. In, in that, right. Like, I'm- yeah. That's so it's like this interesting way of like, you get that, that understanding that, um, that Craig comes from the North, but he's not really so different from like this little tiny world that they're trying to film in Charleston. But isn't he from Maryland? Is he from Maryland? Where's Craig oh, from? Right. Delaware. Okay. So technically, yeah, it is upper south. We could say Delaware's north, but it's upper south. But I, I guess to southerners, it is not upper south, right? It is. Right. Easy yeah. to Sorry, I'm sorry. Go ask my students is I like at everywhere I teach the South class I ask them where is the South and it's the first I do it when I teach classes on the West as well but mm-hmm. the South one is fascinating to me because it becomes very specific very quickly and so here in Southern Indiana it's anything South of the Ohio River when I was a grad mm-hmm. student in Mississippi it was the deep South and it did absolutely did not include Kentucky uh, and most of Virginia surprisingly enough uh, when I was in Louisiana, it included parts of, you know, Texas, uh, did not include North Carolina or Virginia and Georgia, but not Atlanta. And so it becomes a, a you know, Southerners absolutely have these very specific demarcations. You know, Florida, you got to go north to get south because Southern Florida is not the south. And right. Is Kentucky in the South? The Derby is the South. The Derby is actually technically north of me. So, mm. and I'm 100% south of the Mason Dixon line. <laughs> uh, and there was, in fact, slavery in southern Indiana and southern Illinois. So, right. is it just slave right. territory? Is it those who benefited from the plantation complex? Is it is it an attitude? Because if it's an attitude, then it's probably also Oklahoma. Now I'm going to get a bunch of state mail because I've, <laughs> I'm making these state, you know, statements of what the South is. But they, Delaware is one of those, the whole Delmarva region mm-hmm. is sort of a, is it mid-Atlantic? Is it South? It was, it was a slaveholding region. Right. I just throw it into Chesapeake, but I guess for, for, <laughs> for our field, it's, mid, it's mid-Atlantic. Yeah. Mid-Atlantic. Mid Atlantic, but not Chesapeake Mid Atlantic, even though it's anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, Tracy, did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, in fact, I think that actually led us into a really fascinating discussion. And, like, I guess I really haven't done a lot of specific Southern history. So I've never actually been asked that question, you know, like, where would I consider the South? And just listening to you guys talk, it made me think of times I'd been asked, where is the Atlantic world? And I was like, oh, this is really interesting that to, <laughs> to apply this question of where is the South in this way and how interesting that is. And I think that that really complicates in some ways the ways that I think students come into class in California thinking where or what the South is. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. But speaking of historical memory, I do want us to dive into the current, quote, shock. That the cast members on Southern Charm have been feigning this past season for not knowing anything about John C. Calhoun and, you know, like, oh, Catherine's related to him. And, you know, it's like, I call it that, like, 
feigned shock because that was really the reason why she was brought on in season one, right? Was this lineage that she's a part of. So I thought we could talk about um, Shep's boykin and Catherine's Calhoun lineages and how those mean very specific things, especially where they're at, um, both in the context in terms of Southern charm, but the context of um, the South more broadly. Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, that's one of the great lines from the first season when Thomas Ravenel is describing um, in extreme detail that that Catherine is the scion of, of two politically connected families and how desirable that makes her. Uh, and, you know, that he was Several, several decades, um, her her senior, um, he was, I believe he was 52, and she was just 21 uh, at, at the time. But it's these first several seasons, the, the Southern Charm that is present now is very different from the Southern Charm that, you know, began the series. But the first several seasons are all about who are you connected to? And that connects back to many traditions of kin and lineage and dynasty within within South Carolina and the lower south, this idea of family name and pure blood. And mm-hmm. these these ideas of it's it's a class based society without there being an actual entrenched class system. Right. Right. I mean, I, I listen, I don't believe any of the shock. Everyone knows who everyone was, but I understand for ratings, you have the same shock, right? Um, I think the people knew exactly what who was cast for what reason. I think that um, when I was really, I felt almost like slapped in the face with it a little bit when Patricia was on her porch, was it late, uh, with Leva and, and Madison? talking about well I just had no idea and that John C. Calhoun statue coming down is such a good thing and I was thinking to myself what kind of um, mental acrobatics they must all be doing to kind of fall in line to this new sort of characterization of these relationships Mm -hmm. and these families Uh, because uh, of course Patricia knew exactly who Catherine was and who John C. Calhoun was Mm -hmm. in season one, right? Uh, Even Whitney kind of dabbled thinking that, like, Catherine might be, like, an acceptable suitor for him, right, because of these lineages. So Mm -hmm. I just find that super fascinating. Um, Well, I get – well, let me just interject that, okay, obviously I'm quite cantankerous over this subject, but – I'm not saying that I'm not resolving people from knowing who Calhoun is, but we're presuming they had to do mental acrobats. Like maybe, maybe, you know, 20 is 20, 21, you know, we're just presuming. And I think that some ways also we project what uh, we think Southerners should think and feel. That's just kind of it. I'm not saying we're right or wrong. I just want to take this pause and go, huh, well, let me think about that. Do we know for a fact that they, you know, how they will perceive Calhoun is that because that's how I'm interpreting your point, Dixie. You said so they're talking about how great it is the statue is coming down, and I wonder what kind of mental uh, uh, I want to say jumping jack twists and turns they had to do to come up with that storyline. Is that what you're saying, or or did I completely misread it? Not not, not to come up with the storyline, but to come up to like pretend that like that they are wanting to and ready to condemn something that they have spent years uh, kind of uplifting and celebrating. Right. It's not like, it's not like they're like, let's rename the Ravenel bridge. Right. Right. And there's even a point in the season where the Ravenel bridge comes up, but like not in a way it's like, like not criticizing the namesake of the bridge. Right. And so again, it's like, it's like what they're doing for ratings. So, but it's, it's like clear that it's not actually shaking the foundation of their lives 
or their mm-hmm. their lives mm-hmm. or like the way that they are seeing their world in Charleston, if that makes sense, right? So it's like, uh, but they're coming down on the right side of history, I, right? I, it's like it's like I feel like I'm watching them trying um, to create a persona for the camera that fits in the current moment. But at the same time that they are, and I agree, I agree that the likelihood of Danny being best friends with Catherine, but not knowing anything about the Calhoun family, or that Patricia, who very famously spoke uh, about having General Lee's bed in her right. house, is is suddenly not, you know, a confederate in the attic, so to speak. But the the work that the show did and foisted upon Leva and the, what I, what I was viewing was that you, you take the one minority who's a cast member of the show and it seems like they made her do all of the heavy lifting. Didn't they though? Didn't they? And I thought, what is this? She got all pretty in the backlash. It actually is pretty typical being in white predominantly spaces that the one or two minorities have to pick up uh, or people of color have to pick up and do the work for the entire uh, the entire race of a world. So it actually is pretty accurate, but they actually made it happen on TV. That's like, like a microcosm how, okay, the fact that I teach at a predominantly white institution is pretty showing, isn't it? Let me back down. <laughs> Let me back up from that point. Well, and it's also not only th- did they... Did 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 all of this work kind of fall to Leva to do for the cameras? But then Leva is still on camera having to explain that, oh yeah, Patricia also gets like special VIP service at any of her establishments, right? Because it's like, like she also has to like, right, this is her business, this is how she makes money, right? Rolling out the red carpet for Patricia means other specific things. And so, I don't know, I felt like I watched the season also feeling feeling like there was probably not enough meditation (laughs) that could be done or like, you know, nothing like there was whatever like would have like been like healthy and, you know, like healthy space for Leva. I was like, I don't even know if that exists in any way that she could have around these people, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I just kind of was like, in in awe of the patience that she uh, exercised because because it was just, it was, it was hard, it was hard to watch. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was hard to watch. I think she handled it the, you know, the best that she could, uh, the conversations that, that were, were taking place. But I also was struck by just the sheer privilege on display by many of the cast members um but the uh, the anticipation that she had to and that the the other women present at a couple of the dinner scenes were, were responsible with educating them about what was happening as opposed to or you know and Catherine you know decided that she needed to reach out to her as if there isn't a ton of material readily available. Uh, we talk about Googling, you know, why are people mad about these statues? Look it up. Right. Yeah. Look it up. So, yeah. And, oh, sorry, Jessica. Ahead. No, no, go for it. No, I was going to change the conversation drastically, but I, I only want to do that if, we're, if we can leave uh, the South behind for a minute. I was only going to add one more, I was going to add one more thing to kind of put like a cap on this particular conversation. And it was actually something that came to us from a fellow Bravo Demic, Allison Madar. Um, Mm -hmm. She emailed us to say like, did you see this? This is, uh, you know, uh, it was a Bravo style and living article about, um, the quote unquote cottage, uh, on Patricia's property, um, that her Butler Michael lives in. Um, 
And oh yeah. And so Allison writes in this email, I'm I'm reading it, quote, the image of Michael's dwellings and the slave quarters oriented differently in the photos or whatever. Um, but the fact that Patricia mentions the quote cottage was built in the early 1700s means it's most likely the slave quarters. Even if it's not the tone deafness of Bravo to talk about these beautiful homes in Charleston without acknowledging the history of the place and how those homes got built is troubling to say the least. And so we had a really, we had a couple emails back and forth about how, I mean, cause it, this I think I think the article released maybe within days of Patricia being like, oh, John C. Calhoun and Catherine, throw them all away, right? But then she's like, look at this quote, cottage that Michael lives in on my property, right? So it's, again, that's why I say that it was so, um, like, interesting to watch. That they the, feigned not knowing. That they feigned not knowing that they like, pr- like that they're going out of their way to cast things in a way that would be um, acceptable as in to like not land them in, you mm-hmm. know, hot water like Catherine is in. Right. And so, okay. right. And like the average reader isn't going to be like, oh, cottage. Oh, which she really means or those were like, that was where enslaved people right, were supposed to live on the property. Well, right. Right. And so it's this way that they're, that they're all doing the same things that Catherine does. But, um, in this case, it was, uh, clearly more carefully thought how to kind of have it always. Beyond the rights of history. <laughs> yeah. Well, also right. like still being wrong, but like, you know, being at least perceived as right. So, Crystalyn, tell us what's next for you, what you want people to know about your upcoming work. How can they get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Next up, I'm finishing up my book and sending it to the press on the Old Florida Project. And from there, I think I'll end up back in Colonial Virginia uh, after having taken a a moment, a pause. Because I've got a couple uh, areas to explore naturally related to very anxious patriarchs once again just to mm-hmm. you know bring full circle um and and women behaving badly i'm fascinated by uh, edmund scarborough and his mistress Anne toff uh who was a slave owner um and slave indian slave trader as well mm. at a plantation that he bought for her and named gargathia after where the nymphs would play so i think that's the project i'm gonna dive back into after I get the old Florida project done. But I'm available on Twitter um, at Crystal and Marie, and I'm at the University of Southern Indiana. So that's all readily available to, to look up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. As always, you can find us at historiansonhousewives.com, where you can propose your own episode topic, ask us questions, and send us feedback. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at historiansh. And don't forget that you can like and review the podcast on your podcast platform. You can also find us at our Etsy shop, Historians Housewives. This episode was powered by Acast. Thank you, Crystal and Shoveland. This show was brought to you with the support by... Barbara and Mark Spear, Saddleback Community College, Molly Callahan, Dr. Joaquin Galarza, Courtney Crow, Laura Loper, Kim Bettendorf, Louis Cio de Dios, and the Angie Pong Foundation. And remember, scholars do bravo too. <laughs> <laughs>